In this video, we're going to be talking about vehicles, a mechanic explored in Wrath of the Lich King, although utilized a few other times in WoW's history. These things are a point of contention within the community, if they make endgame good or bad, although there is one fact, they do allow for fights to be drastically different from any fights possible without vehicles. Starting off at number 10, we have the Mutated Construct from the Amber Shaper Unsok fight. The boss would randomly encase players in Living Amber. During this fight, players will need to DPS down the Amber to free the player before they run out of their dwindling willpower to survive. Now, what separates this from just a CC is that you're able to move around and fight. Plus, you can use four abilities. Consume Amber allows you to absorb Amber off the ground, giving you both willpower and health. The benefit being that you remove AoE from the ground for your raid members. Next is Struggle for Control, which at the cost of willpower increases the Construct's damage taken for a while, as well as interrupting the ability Amber Explosion, which the Construct will cast on its own once in a while, which does a massive raid ride amount of damage. Next is Amber Strike, a big single attack with a debuff that increases the damage the target takes, as well as interrupting their spellcasting. This is really good to use on the boss, as well as the other adds that also cast Amber Explosion. Last is Break Free. Once you reach 20% max health, this is what players can use to break free instead of dying. This creates quite an interesting fight where players become encased in a creature that they can somewhat control, and must fight the beast's own will to do their best to help their raid, while the raid tries to break them free, before the beast takes hold completely and kills them. And at number 9, we have the Soulbound Construct, from Sakrathar the Eternal. During the fight, you must battle Sakrathar within his mech, but after dealing enough damage to it, he is forced out of it, allowing you to take control of it and, with its help, fight Sakrathar himself. Although, if you take too long, he kicks you out, controlling his mech once again, and then you rinse and repeat. The first attack of the mech does a massive amount of cleave damage, as well as applying a debuff that increases damage taken, used to damage and weaken Sakrathar and all of his backup. Its second ability allows it to create a Soul Trap, a large circle that, once an enemy steps into, will trap all nearby enemies and reduce their damage taken by 99% for 30 seconds. This is used to counter ghosts that appear from portals, and will fixate on players. By stacking these perfectly, you can just ignore the ghosts completely as they will appear from the portal and get stuck. Next is the Fell Orb, a large AoE damaging ability that allows you to devastate groups of spawning ads. Simple as that. And last is the Fell Blaze Charge, allowing you to place down large patches of fire that slow and damage anything that step into it. A great way to slow those ghosts and other ads. Quite a fun fight for the player inside the mech, as it's normally quite hectic with all the ads and ghosts outside but with the help of the mech pilot, it can become a very simple fight to micromanage. And at number 8, we have the Abomination, from the Professor Putricide fight in ICC. During this fight, you deal with slime poured onto the floor in the fighting area, as well as slime spawning from tanks at each end of the room attempting to attack the players. At the start of the fight, a single player can run past the Professor to drink a potion on his table, which will transform him to the Abomination. While in the Abomination, it has three abilities that are very simple, but very important to know what they do. Your first ability is to eat oozes, which allows you to consume the area of oozes left on the ground, gaining energy from it. Regurgitate ooze costs this energy, but allows you to spew it onto enemies, slowing and dealing damage to them. Best use on the slime summoned by the boss to slow them so your players can both kill and escape the attacking ads. And last is a simple slash attack, putting a physical damage increase debuff on enemies, great to use on the boss, a way to increase your raid's DPS when you're not busy dealing with the adds, or running around the room just eating oozes, which is what you do most of the time. During the quest for the Shadowmorn, there is also another ability that infuses the axe with the power of the plague, by filling it with a blight multiple times, making the fight quite hard as you consume slime, but don't use it to slow adds. And next, at number 7, we have our first dungeon boss, the Grand Champions fight within the Trial of the Champions, the Jousting Mounts. All you do is go to the side of the room and grab a jousting pole, and then hop onto a horse or a wolf, and then you can begin the fight. You are challenged by a few enemy jousters from three random vanilla or TBC races from the enemy faction, before then fighting their champions. The second phase has you fighting these champions on foot, but the first phase is the important one. Jousters can shield up, which gives them three armor plating, reducing the damage taken by 30% for each one. These platings must be broken by a charge attack, which causes you to rush in and break a plate, as well as do some heavy damage. Or a shield breaker, a ranged attack that does low damage, but breaks one of the platings. 
And last, you can thrust, a simple jab with your jousting pole, doing heavy damage but only if the enemies are shield free. And if your mount dies during combat, you can get another one, but enemies will be quick to trample you down to death. This is one of the closest encounters we've had to getting a fully functional, mounted combat setting in a raid. And players were very mixed on the idea with this, which is why it's kind of lower on the list. And at number 6, we have the chess event with Karazhan. Medivh was quite the powerful mage, and because of this, of course he would have a magical chess set. And within this set is the Horde and Alliance acting as pieces on the board. The usual pieces are all replaced with Orc and Human Troops. It's quick to say this is nothing like actual chess, other than the general concept of beat the enemy king. These pieces can move around and fight each other, and while I'd love to go over all these pieces and their abilities individually, there are far, far too many of them. But each piece has their own range of abilities, ranking from tanking units, healing units, DPS units, etc, etc. All with the worry of Medivh cheating, placing fire underneath your units, making it quite the hectic match for players to try and direct a small army of units to protect their king. And since this was introduced in the Burning Crusade, this is in theory the first vehicle fight ever introduced in WoW, and is a huge pain to solo for anyone who tries to run through the old version of Karazhan. And at number 5, we go back to the Icy North, but this time for the Loot Ship, or better known as the Ice Crown Gunship Battle. This fight, while mostly about players, has a very heavy focus on the vehicles, as if not for them, this fight would literally be impossible. Starting the fight, you take off on your faction airship. There are three roles people can take as the other faction airship approaches. First being the turrets, with only two buttons, the first one being a basic shot that damages whatever the projectile hits, enemy faction members, or the ship itself, while also generating heat. The second being a flame shot that does heavy damage based on how much heat the gun has, and empties all of the heat. Second role is for people to stay on the ship defending from invading members of the other faction, who will teleport to the ship in order to try to kill you. The third is the players putting on jetpacks and jumping over to the enemy ship to kill the enemies and mages that will appear and freeze your turrets. This fight was extremely easy, and because of this it was nicknamed the Loot Ship, with most groups setting this fight to heroic as soon as they could, because it was easier on heroic than most of the fights at normal, even with the precedent that no matter what, you needed those turrets firing to win the game. And at number 4, we have Malagos from the Eye of Eternity. During the first and second phase, it's a very basic fight. However, come the final phase, the players meet a definite death. Standing upon a platform floating among space, Malagos destroys everything, causing players to plummet to their death, and World of Warcraft ends. Or that's what would happen, if not for a swarm of red dragons coming in and catching the players, sent by the other dragonflights to help fight Malagos. Players are then able to move in full space, up, down, forward, back, left, right, so on and so forth, giving people full control. And at this point, the boss simply floats there casting three spells. A large AoE that forces players to stay away from him, preventing players from getting close. Another being targeting a random player and dealing large AoE damage around them, causing the group and the target to separate, usually to just die. And lastly, he will target random players and hit them with very powerful blast of magic. Now, how do you counter these? Well, first the dragons use both combo points and energy, almost like a rogue. First having the flame spike ability, dealing fire damage, generating points, and consuming energy. Then engulf in flame, dealing lots of fire damage while costing energy and lasting longer based on how many combo points it uses up. These being the two DPS abilities for the dragon. Then the two healing abilities, revivify, giving a heal over time to allies, awarding a combo point, and costing energy and Life Burst, a large healing AoE that also increases your healing done, again costing some energy but lasting longer per combo point spent. And then the two utility spells, Flame Shield, allowing the players targeted by the Blast of Magic an attempt at life, reducing damage taken based on how many combo points you consume to cast a spell. And lastly, Blazing Speed, a simple cooldown giving you a burst of speed, good for the players with AoE that need to get out of the group. A fun fight of Drake armies taking down a dragon aspect in space. Anyone could be a healer or a DPS, and well, who the tank was was chosen at random. And at number 3, we include a famously hated dungeon, the Oculus. 
This dungeon was quite infamous because of its vehicle mechanics, but mostly just because of its role in the looking for dungeon system. People wanted to blast through the dungeons in Wrath of the Lich King, and this one was kind of hard to overgear since it had a required vehicle mechanic. So about a third of the way through climbing this tower of floating disc and panels, you would come to three dragons in cages, an Amber Damage, Ruby Tank, and Emerald Healer. Once you freed them, you can speak to them to get an item you could use for the rest of the dungeon, summoning that dragon which then became a vehicle. Each dragon had their own abilities. From then on, you needed to work your way through a 3D space, flying through the sky to fight dragons and land on other platforms to fight on foot. Eventually leading to the final boss, which is just on the dragons. Navigating a maze through the sky and doing vehicle mechanics with a new rotation, I'm sure you can see why people would have a problem with this in the random dungeon queues. So let's go over the abilities, shall we? The Ruby Dragon had Martyr, an ability allowing you to redirect all harmful spells to yourself. Then Searing Wrath, dealing damage and chaining to four other targets, dealing more damage with each jump. Evasive Maneuvers, dodging all attacks, however requiring evasive charges to do so, which are gathered simply by being attacked outside of the ability's use. Next is the Emerald Drake used for healing your allies. Leeching Poison, dealing damage and healing yourself for the damage dealt. Dream Funnel, allowing you to transfer health from yourself to allies. And Touch of the Nightmare, allowing you to consume your own health to deal damage to an enemy and reduce their damage dealt. Quite a unique playstyle of stealing health from enemies and then using your own health to heal allies. And then last, the DPS Amber Drink. Temporal Rift allows you to cause a target to take double damage during its channel, and depending on damage dealt, generates shock charges, which are blown up by shock lands to deal damage. Dealing a bit of damage, but dealing massive damage for each charge detonated. And lastly, stop time. Freezing all enemy dragons for 10 seconds, and applying 5 shock charges to them. Quite interesting to stop time, apply debuffs, and then blow them up for huge damage. The idea of sticking to the tank DPS heal roll, but with specific dragons, it's quite fun. It may get that you are flying around, fighting on top of a tower in the sky, you get an overall awesome fight. Maybe the first time you do it. Or as long as you're not in a hurry. And at number two, we have a very odd one. We had some internal debate if we should add it or not, but because of how unique it made the dungeon, uh, we thought we should include it. So next we have Grim Batal. After only the first few packs, you would find five dragons trapped. Upon releasing them, they would allow you to hop on their backs and do a strafing run before they leave. What this entails is that you can shoot fireballs down and track mobs below you, either weakening their HP or outright killing them. And yes, any damage dealt is kept. So when you eventually go to that trash pack, it very well may only have 5% HP left. That was amazing, as it allowed you to affect the dungeon itself by choosing to either outright kill specific packs that you might have trouble with, or weaken packs that you feel would be best to kill quickly. And especially since the strafe run crossed a good three-fourths of the entire dungeon, meant you could do a lot of damage to make your dungeon run way faster. This was such a unique mechanic, and really would be an amazing thing to see again in future dungeons. And maybe even raids. It's one of the few vehicle mechanics from a dungeon that players actually liked on a whole, so it has to take a high spot on this list. And now at number one, I'm sure you all knew this would be here, the most famous and well done of all the vehicle battles, and that is of course the Flame Leviathan, and its many different vehicles used to combat it. The first boss within the Old War raid, commonly seen as the best raid of all time. This raid was a showcase of Blizzard's new mechanics and systems that they were trying out with the Wrath of the Lich King, and because of this they led right out the gate with huge vehicle fights. Upon entering Old War, people would be met with the defense of the Titan City. Hundreds of thousands of rune dwarves, rune giants, and titanic machines, all empowered and created by Titan towers and factories. Players would be forced to assault the city's outer defenses, and with this, they got a choice. Various amounts of vehicles sat around them, so they could all choose one vehicle. The first vehicle choice was the steam tank. The large tank contained energy like steam pressure, slowly generating over time. First they had a ram which dealt massive damage and knocked back units, dealing bonus damage to buildings like the titanic towers. Next is the electroshock, dealing damage to all enemies in a cone in front, and interrupting spell casts. Last is steam rush, causing the vehicle to rush forward, ramming enemies in their way. The tank had two extra seats to keep passengers safe, but on top of this tank it also had a turret, a small cannon that had a few abilities of its own, and it used steam pressure. First, an anti-air rocket that allowed it to shoot down gyrocopters, 
as well as gyro hooks, which held canisters of pyrite. The second ability was a large cannon that simply dealt good damage to whatever you were able to hit. And lastly, a shield generator, producing a large shield that absorbed damage taken by the tank for a few seconds. Next is the Demolisher. Its first ability was Hurl Boulder, which allowed it to launch explosives from a long range. Next was Hurl Pyrite, allowing it to consume some of its pyrite reserves to deal a burning dot to anything it hit. And this stacked, becoming quite powerful on bosses, meaning you wanted to constantly keep max stacks of it up. Next it had a small ram ability, really just there to deal with close range enemies, and also structures at close range. Last is a throw passenger ability. The only real use for this was the quite rare times when a nearby vehicle would die and you wanted to save raid members. You could recover them from the destroyed vehicle and launch them to the safety of a steam tank's empty passenger seat, as the giant flame leviathan would kill players in less than a second. Then in the passenger seat, a player could launch a small mortar, as well as anti-air rockets, both for the same reasons as the steam tank's turrets. It also had a load catapult, which allowed you to be launched by throw passenger. It then had the ability increase speed, consuming pyrite from the vehicle to give the machine a boost to speed for a fair while. And while we have been talking about pyrite a little bit, I never really explained what it did. Well, those gyro hooks who you would shoot down with the anti-air rockets would drop their pyrite crate on the ground, which you could then pick up and supply the demolishers to replenish their pyrite reserves. This is what the final ability for the passenger is for. Grab pyrite. Grabbing a crate of pyrite to refill the vehicle's reserves. And now for the last vehicle, the chopper. A small motorcycle, its main job to being run over grabbing pyrite and putting it in its sidecar, then delivering it to demolishers, as it pretty commonly dropped far from the slow catapults. Having a sidecar, a player could also get in and you can heal them with the first aid kit, allowing them to get weak members away from danger and then heal them up. To actually help the raid, it could place tar behind itself, slowing enemies that entered it and dealing fire damage if it was lit on fire, by, well, any fire using energy to power its final two abilities, a simple speed boost, and its sonic horn, which dealt damage to enemies in a large frontal cone. So to quickly go over their roles, you had the steam tank to act as a frontline defense, and its turret to deal some damage and shoot down air enemies in pyrite. Then you had the demolisher to deal massive damage to the boss and consume pyrite, plus its gunner who would deal some damage, grab the pyrite, and shoot down air units. Lastly, you had the chopper who would deliver pyrite to demolishers and place tar. The Flame Leviathan fight is really the best fight for a reason. So many vehicles, so many roles, and really filled the feel of a huge battle of metal and machine. Especially with the option to destroy towers before engaging the Flame Leviathan to make the fight easier. Or leave them alive to make the fight harder and get extra loot. Flame Leviathan is the definition of a vehicle fight. Alright, and that's the video. Hopefully we see more vehicle fights in the future, as Flame Leviathan really showed how good a vehicle fight can be. And as long as you don't make too many, they are a welcome addition once in a while. Even if people will occasionally groan when they hear of a vehicle fight in an upcoming raid. If you think there's any other vehicle fights that are much better than the ones that we listed on this list, I'd love to hear about them down in the comments, as well as ideas for future videos just like this one. This video was edited by Felplague, one of my editors. And did you know, I now have a D&D channel very similar to this one, full of nothing but highly edited top 10s. If you have a passing interest in the subject, I'd highly recommend you check it out, linked in the video description at the end of the video right now.